Hi, this is Steve Gilmore, and this is The Gilmore Gang. Let's see, nothing's going on this week, so uh, <laughs> this will be a really short show. Just kidding. <laughs> thank you, Oracle. Thank you, Google. Thank you, Verizon. <coughs> thank you, FCC. We've got some uh, interesting uh, voices here today. Uh, starting uh, to my right, uh, the illustrious British philosopher, Andrew Keane. Welcome, Andrew. Hello. Hang on a second. We'll get you on the picture, I hope. Thank you. Say hello again. Hello, everybody. Uh, to his right, and this is in the studio here, uh, is uh, the infamous Robert Scoble. What's up? I'm finally back at home. Excellent. Where were you before? I was in uh, D.C. yesterday uh, talking at the Red Cross, which was pretty interesting. And last week I was at uh, the Bing Labs in Colorado. So that's right. You know, you left your camera on, so we uh, we broadcast for another two hours and heard all sorts <laughs> of uh, NDA stuff. It was fantastic. <laughs> you did leave your camera on. Yeah. Uh, uh, and in the middle, uh, where he belongs, is uh, Danny Sullivan. Welcome, Danny. Thank you. Hi. And uh, joining us from uh, the uh, Salesforce Cloud Blog Compound is uh, John Toshek. Hello. All right, so uh, who should we start with? I, I didn't get to read the link that uh, Andrew posted about somebody who has a good opinion uh, uh, from his perspective about what's going on with Google and Verizon. So uh, could you summarize what you thought was intelligent about that post that I haven't read? Me? Yeah. Well, it suggested that, um, that there's this exaggerated paranoia. Well, I guess all paranoia is exaggerated about um, Google and Verizon's attempt to, to get to an agreement um, about uh, how, how, you, how you legislate the Internet. And every time anyone does anything, particularly a big company, usually Google was on the other side, but now they're with the big bad guys like AT&T and Verizon and Comcast. Anytime they try and do anything, which obviously reflects their own self-interest since they're for-profit companies, everyone has a conniption fit, a moral meltdown claiming that they're stealing the Internet. When the reality is that the FCC is still struggling to come up with a deal on network neutrality, and the Google-Verizon initiative, it's not an agreement, but their talks are an attempt to try and figure out where to go and, and how to do it in a coherent way. And the fact that Verizon and Google are actually talking to one another is a good thing because they generally don't talk to one another. It's not as if Google has suddenly become evil. Google was never either good or evil. It was simply a, a large self-interested company like any other. So. Uh, I think the, the, the public hysteria, particularly on the internet, about these large company initiatives are unhealthy and childish. And I don't know really where they or I do know where they come from, but I think adults like uh, all of us need to, need to put a, a stop to it. Well, other than I haven't recalled uh, Google having a, a, a marketing campaign that says, you know, we're not evil, we're not. Uh, we aren't. We are evil. We're not an evil. Doesn't matter. We're uh, a for-profit company, and we're going to do what we want to. And uh, what, in fact, they've been doing for uh, quite a long time is selling the idea of being open for open sake. Uh, what's good for the internet's good for Google, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah. uh, I think that there's a, a fair amount of backlash uh, from a company that, as recently as a couple of months ago, was saying the exact opposite about. Well, but the thing is, is that. You know, I'd be interested in Dan's opinion on this, but certainly I was always saying that that's absolute nonsense, and anyone that believes that is an idiot. So all Google's behavior did is confirm that they're just like any other company, and that openness is yeah, a yeah, business Yeah, except, Andrew, it, it you know, if you go back and look at the statements that Google's made over the years, they've been very pro-network net neutrality, and this shifted a uh, sizable shift in, the, in, the, in what they were saying publicly and what they were supporting. And so, yeah, we can get a little hung up on the evil uh, thing, but they ha this week represented a sizable shift in their outward public stance on network neutrality. Yeah, but the reason for that, my guess, and again, Danny knows more about this than I do, is that their position is changing because of the shift in the nature of mobile. 
And historically, they've been uh, in favor of network neutrality because it's benefited them. Yeah. Now it's less clear, so they're less in favor. I mean, that's just normal, natural, right? Why, why would they do anything else? Yeah, well, I think that, that the backlash represents our, uh, our realization of that. I mean, I, we thought Google was a friendly company to the Internet, and now we realize, oh, it's just like the cable company. Well, but I, I get, let's bring Danny in because I, I don't think that. Hey, this fair, isn't is uh, keen on anything. You know, go over to TechCrunch TV if you want to run the show. Uh, Danny, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, very funny. Um, I I agree with Andrew that you know I think Google more and more is like any other company. Um, <clears throat> Some of that's inevitable. They are like any other company. They're a bigger company that does many more things, and it's harder and harder for them not to make compromises. And I think that, you know, when they started out, I, I don't think, and I don't recall them ever suggesting that the wireless Internet needed less regulation than the wired Internet. And that's been the sticking point with me on their proposal, was that they seem to buy into this idea that the wireless Internet didn't need to be uh, following some of these rules that they think the wired internet had because I guess the wireless internet hasn't developed enough. Uh, that that just doesn't wash with me. I think that the rules ought to be the same. And, and the argument seemed to be that, well, you know, for one thing, in their most recent rebuttal, you know, 3G networks are still developing. <laughs> it's like 3G networks, we're moving into 4G networks. So we have 3G networks we have 3G wireless that works fairly well and has been working fairly well. Um, you know, probably one of the biggest challenges to it has simply been that, you know, you have a lot more video content that's being pushed across and that's, you know, putting a burden on some of these carriers. But then the carriers also seem to be quite happy to charge us more for the amount of data that we're using. So I, I just didn't buy that argument that the wireless Internet needed to be excluded. And, and that just kind of felt like a sellout to me. Okay, so uh, what part of agreeing with Andrew uh, were you just saying? Because I didn't get it. Well, Andrew was saying that, you know, it's not that Google, <laughs> correct me if I got it wrong, Andrew, but it's not that Google, you know, is particularly trying to be saying, hey, we're, we're the evil company. Oh, we are an evil company. They're just a big company that's becoming more and more like other big companies where... You know, you don't look at them as the poster child of they do everything right and they please everybody. In fact, I don't know that any company could ever please everybody that's out there. Um, but Google has been, you know, clear on this whole net neutrality thing that they felt like, I guess, the net should be neutral and that people shouldn't feel like there's a, an express lane that certain providers would pay for. And the statement this week seemed to back away from that stance when it came to the wireless Internet. All right. Well, anybody want to counteract? Which was an odd shit. Robert? No, I, I think I've said it. I'm, I'm actually pretty dis disappointed with Google in its shift uh, here. It's been so clear for so long of what what side of the line they stood on, and now they've jumped on the other side of the line, and and that's okay. Now we know they're just like the cable company. They're out after. Uh, Profits and greed and all that, and I, I totally agree with the TechCrunch post last night. You know, it's okay that Google stands up for greed, but it's a different company than I grew up with. You know, over the last ten years. Well, I, I think that's mythology. I think that Google was always a greedy company. They just uh, <laughs> they, they greed was no, but they've been but very they clear on network neutrality for ten years. They've been very clear that they're for network neutrality. Period. They are for an open internet because that yeah. helps Google. Now they're switching over to the other side of the fence because oh, there's a lot of money in in uh, in wireless, and we can make it. We can get in bed with Verizon and make a deal here, and we can siphon off billions of dollars off of off of the marketplace, and that's okay. I you know I, I'm all for uh, companies being profitable too. I work for a public company. We we're out for profit, but uh, when you've been on one side of the aisle for or uh, one side of the line for 10 years, and then you switch, it's notable, and it, it, uh, it's sad. But I think you misrepresent it, because I think the reason no, why... No, go Google... back and read every... No, no, they, they let me, so let, let let me finish. So Listen to what I'm saying. You haven't even heard what I'm saying yet. Uh, I think you re misrepresent it in the sense that you're saying Google was in favor of network neutrality because 
it benefit because they were in favor of an open internet and that they were idealists and at one point they were a good company. I think the reason historically Google has been in favor of network neutrality is because they don't want to pay the guys who own the pipes to travel on them so that they don't want to pay large bucks for running YouTube on uh, on, Ver on the Verizon network. It's got nothing to do with them being good. It's simply got <coughs> to do with self-interest. And now, because of, I think, the mobile web and the complexity of, of this issue, they're shifting. But I, I would strongly disagree that they were once a good company. They've always been a company purely focused on self-interest. And they've always been very good at dressing that up. They've always been a very good marketing well, company. Well, but you can't have it both ways, Andrew. Either they used to be good at it and they now really suck at it. Or well, that's a good question. That, that's, a, that's a fair question. And that's what I still can't understand is, was this a huge marketing screw-up? Or did they know what they were doing and put their fingers over their ears and said, we're going to have to blow this thing up and we have to accept the consequences? I don't know the answer to that. Some so, people say to me that so Schmidt I mean, that was, was just intrigued by all this. Hang on a second. I want to get Toshek in on this. I, uh, hang on one second. John, anything? Well, I think... Uh, Your audio you know, is horrible. Big marketing Can you hear me okay? Uh, not really. Uh, it's yeah. distorting, but go ahead. Try it again. I'll go closer to my microphone. Um, the, um, uh, you know, is it a marketing blow up? I mean, the way they, the way they released this was in a blog, and, and the blog is, you know, very clearly not, an, uh, it's an official capacity, but it's very different from a, from a, um, what Google could have done if they were really serious. To me, it seems like it's testing the waters. And they did test yeah. the waters with a, a separate internet a couple of years ago, uh, when they said that they wanted to have a, a high-speed band um, that, that it was required. Uh, basically, what this blog said, to, what this blog is, they said it a couple of years ago, but no one really kind of screamed at it. Now that now that they uh, are separating out the wired internet from the wireless internet, now people are getting it, you know, upset. I think it's also uh, important to go back into net neutrality. Um, which is not that old. It's not as old as Google, for for instance, the specific FCC regulations. Um, it's meant so that the more that a consumer uses the internet, that the more that they put into it, the in, into the infrastructure itself, so that it gets improved over time. And I think what Google is realizing is that it didn't get improved over time to the degree that they wanted to, and they kind of want to change that with wireless so they can have an impact on it. And if if you look at like our our wired access, our bandwidth compared to other countries, we're kind of in the middle of first world countries. We're kind of at the top of second world countries as far as the average uh, download speeds or upload speeds that that people get. Um, and I think Google just realizes there's so much more content that's going to be shifted that they should that they need to have that impact on wireless. And I think that's where uh, people come in. Um, uh, pretty against Google and Verizon as the two behemoths that are kind of planning to merge together. But the, the, the third thing I want to say is that this was not even directed, even though it's directed at the FCC, it was lobbed into Congress, right? So it's, uh, it's trying to kind of go around the FCC and, and, and uh, kind of diminish, diminish the capacity of the FCC. That is more of the evil thing to me than, uh, than anything. Well, although it might FCC, be FCC, uh, you know. Give me a break. <laughs> we are exactly. It's ineffectual, um, and and will be less so. But what's what, what's going to be more effectual? You know, effective Congress. I mean, well, they're already going to be more effectual. Is Oracle? You know, <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. I hope. Um, Robert, you were trying to say something. No. Okay. I, so uh, this is the. Ben I was Gilmore saying. Game. I mean, oh, okay. I, I was saying. Back to the idea that Google's always been, you know, I suppose, greedy or just always been a, a company for profit. I wouldn't agree with that. Um, I think, for example, when Google came out as a search engine, they weren't doing something called paid inclusion, where you could pay and actually have your listings be more represented within the search engines. They took a very strong stance against that. Even though they could have made money, they could have done a lot of things in their search results to make a lot more money by, by charging people to be in there in a variety of ways, and probably would have gotten away with it. And one of the reasons that they said they didn't want to do is they just didn't think it was the right thing to do. 
And I think that Google very much always tried to do what they think is the right thing to do. And I think that's also part of the disconnect that they're having right now. When Google makes one of these decisions, I think they get into their mindset, well, this is the right thing to do. And they get shocked when everybody else doesn't see it in their same way. I don't know that this represents that suddenly they become even more evil. I just think it represents that they have to make even more compromises and they have to be more realistic about the things that they want. And a few years ago when they would be talking about where we want neutrality and we want to have all this stuff happen, you know, the, the reality is they probably have to make compromises to get to that. And, and one last thing is it's not just about them not wanting to pay. It's that they don't want to find themselves blocked out either. Um, you can imagine a scenario where maybe Microsoft and Verizon cut a deal and Microsoft gets to have all of its stuff on a priority lane and Google stuff is stuck in, you know, the netherworld. That, the internet is Google's oxygen and if somebody manages to cut that off, they feel very strongly that they're going to be screwed. So, it, I, it's, I don't think it's just the case they don't want to pay out the money, it's that they want to just also make sure that it's an equal playing field for them in this place that they have to operate on. Well, I, I agree with a, a large part of that analysis. The one thing that uh, I think you should, uh, that I would like to sort of amplify what you just said is that this is an example of Google being very weak. Uh, they are, you know, if you take a look at the last six months in terms of, uh, of uh, Android, uh, their inability to be able to really move the carriers at all in terms of... Uh, the rollout of Android has been pretty significant, especially given the the number of Android phones that have been activated. They've got a significant market share here, but they haven't been able to uh, get any specific uh, uh, carrier to do anything, uh, even remotely close to what Apple's been able to do with AT&T. Uh, the, the whole Wi-Fi build-out, for example, uh, on the iPhone has been stunning in its, uh, uh, in its implications. It's, I don't know who wrote it. I know I wrote about it just now on CloudBlog. But the uh, the ability to be able to set up essentially a virtual uh, Wi-Fi network or, around FaceTime uh, is really going to have a huge impact as people start moving off of the carriers, you know, the wireless carriers at all. Uh, you know, the the more that we have, uh, uh, somebody wrote about this and suggested that uh, that oh, it was uh, Dana Blankenhorn, I believe. Who, who covers the health arena, and he said that, uh, you know, hospitals are basically becoming a huge data pump over Wi-Fi, uh, you know, in, you know, various major cities. We're starting to see a, a Wi-Fi build-out, which if it reaches a, a real, uh, you know, crescendo, is going to make the value proposition of, of, uh, of you know, 3G or even 4G uh, somewhat irrelevant, except when you're on the move. And uh, we all know that uh, even uh, Wi-Fi on the move is starting to, to have its impact. So uh, I think that this is, uh, you know, more of a, uh, of a, you know, basically this isn't Google doing something. This is Verizon basically uh, cracking the whip on Google. And it's kind of surprising how quickly this is sort of turned over. I have my own opinions about why that's happening. I think that Apple has essentially set up a, uh, a little uh, net neutrality, high-speed bandwidth, uh, you know, you know, sub microsystem of its own, where uh, applications are paying the freight for uh, building out the network and and creating innovation. And I think Google's taking a look at this and saying that they're they're trying to play catch up here. Any comments on that, Andrew? Sounds intelligent. Um, well, but I yeah, but. Thanks for the uh, feedback. Well, I, I, <laughs> someone said to me that they thought that uh, Eric Schmidt was just would loves the opportunity to be in the limelight and loved the opportunity to appear with Seidenberg of uh, Verizon. I don't know if that's true. I mean, sometimes uh, you tend to over over conceptualize and come up with very complex reasons for things, and sometimes it's just people. Um, I don't know what what's behind it, but certainly. Uh, well, if well, I over like if I over conceptualize and I'm right, uh, then you know I'll take the uh, 
I'll take the hit on that. So, uh, well, it's always easy to, the, to come out with to the, sophisticated explanations. I mean, do you really so think? Do you really think that Google is showing strength here or weakness? Is what I'm asking you. That's a really good question. I would say it's more. Well, it's, I don't think either word is perhaps appropriate, but it's closer to weakness than strength. <coughs> I mean, it shows that they can't bust the networks. It shows, I mean, historically they've always, remember when they used to do things and sort of just chuck a bomb at the networks and say, we're going to be our own network, we're going to do our own stuff. Now it shows that Google needs to partner. But I think that again shows that as a company it's growing up and it understands that it needs to work with other people and you can never do anything on your own. So in a sense mm -hmm. it might reflect a new kind of strength, but a strength of realism. Because they just never accomplish anything. I mean, it's a company that has the gold mine in search and some potential with their mobile stuff, but everything else is a disaster. So the fact that they're willing to work with a real company on a real issue might reflect on new maturity. Anybody? Well, I'd agree. I think they're a more pragmatic company. Um, if they want to get... I think that, you know, part of what has happened is not to... Verizon, you know, called them up one day and said, "All right, Google, now you got to do this sort of thing." I think it's that as they've grown up and that they've worked with partners, they get partners that explain stuff to them, and then they start thinking it's very reasonable. I think that Verizon has probably been talking with them and been saying, "Look, you know, as they've been talking with other partners, we've got these kinds of challenges as well. We can't just snap our fingers and make certain things happen the way that you may think that they should happen." And you know, you get closer to them, and then they think they, they, that they get convinced it's in a reasonable stance. And and then of course they feel like they get their head chopped off when they step out because everybody else hasn't been involved in that reasonable discussion. It's, it's very much like what happened with them on China. They didn't do any censorship in China for years. Um, they kept getting accused of people who were saying, well, what would happen if they did this? But they didn't do anything. And then one day we all wake up and they said, hey, guess what? We're going to do, um, we're going to start censoring out there. And a lot of people went, well, what's up with that? And they're like, well, we've consulted and we've talked with a lot of people. It's like, no, you didn't. You talked with a tiny number of people and you didn't let anybody know that you were even thinking about making that decision until you actually made it. And so again here, nobody, nobody in general, there was nothing on the Google blog that I can recall that said, by the way, you know, we've been thinking more and more, maybe we don't need to have net neutrality when it comes to wireless networks because of all these reasons. What do you think? And I know you can't get a million different responses that are going to come in and pick out something like that, but there's no trial balloon at all. It was just like, well, this is what we've decided. Oh, well, okay. Well, don't be surprised if suddenly everybody else feels like you've done a 180 on something that because you did do a 180 on it and you didn't give any heads up that that was even something that you were considering well you know it came out because uh, the FCC basically uh, shut down the uh, you know their complicity in those talks uh, and as soon as they did that uh, it, it seemed like Google and Verizon said no wait a minute FCC why don't you go sit over there in the chair and shut the hell up because mm -hmm. we're in charge so, well, they didn't say that. But oh, they, yes, they did. The, the, if you look at the announcements, uh, it was FCC. There were some rumblings about, it, I believe, in the Wall Street Journal uh, or the New York Times. One or the other reported on uh, Google and Verizon having talks uh, that were going on with the involvement of the FCC. And uh, and as soon as that that was public, the FCC came out and said that we're we're shutting down those talks. Because, you know, the, we're exploring this and we're exploring other things as well. In other words, they basically backed out of support for it. And then the next day, Google and Verizon make this big announcement. Well, I think is, it's, a very, it's a very complex, high-stake, massively high-stake poker game in which there are a few massive players. And it's, it's, it's very unclear. Even, I mean, I know some of the people who work in these things. They don't understand it. It's, it's unclear if anybody understands. It's like the Eastern question in the 19th century. There's only three people alive who understand it, and two of those are dead. Um, so it's just... But the, the other thing, I think, to bear in mind is that AT&T came out and said that they were, they were pleased that Verizon and uh, Google were talking to one another. So I think that 
there is a need to have to oh, amazing the uh, the uh, other major stakeholder in the united yeah. states comes out and agrees with the other carrier gee what a shock yeah but everywhere i just read something on TechCrunch, which presents verizon and at&t as competitors uh so the fact yeah but give me a break i mean I, <laughs> they're they have the same business model and if that business model goes away for one it goes away for the other you know i'm paying i'm paying more to at&t than a a, a normal family pays in uh, house payments in a month you know uh um, that's that's not my fault you're why are no, you but so it, much? It, you know what? You you look at it, innovation and where it comes from. It comes from things that are available to everybody, and not to just the rich people in the world. Well, and that goes back to the idea of them. You know, th this whole thing that the wireless space doesn't have enough competition. It's got huge competition already, and yet we don't see any sort of benefits from it. The, the carriers seem to be able to do whatever they want to do to you on your data plans. They can just up the data if they want. I mean, forget net neutrality, right? I mean, let's say we got net neutrality, and let's say we got net neutrality as it applied to the wireless Internet. That doesn't prevent AT&T from deciding that, hey, you know what? Um, we think a gigabyte a month is all that you should get for $100, and if you want more data than that, it's going to go up. And if you don't like it, walk over to one of the other three people in all that you can go to compared to many more options that you have if you want to go with, you know, broadband alternatives. They, they, they've got, you know, very locked down services that they can provide. We don't actually have a whole lot of choice. And more important, we don't have choice because the airways are very scarce. And that's the whole point of buying licenses. And that's the whole point of having some regulation out there is that these companies are allowed to provide services for product over public airwaves and they have some responsibilities to ensure that the public is being well served by that and I don't know that being well served is you get stuck with whatever they're gonna push at you and you have to live with that for two years because for most people the device you bought was very expensive and you just can't go swapping it out yeah. So what, do we want to talk about Oracle? <laughs> uh, well, the uh, chat room does. Uh, it's there's been some fascinating kinds of discussions going on, uh, uh, as I think Jim Posner was pointing us at uh, uh, Miguel Diacaza's blog uh, posts about uh, the history of of uh, Sun's involvement with Java and their open sourcing of it, and then. Uh, what's happening now with uh, Oracle's move is is compelling reading. It also brings uh, another player that uh, uh, hasn't been on the uh, front burner for a while, Jonathan Schwartz, uh, back for uh, uh, some examination of what he did when he open sourced Java and uh, whether or not uh, uh, Sun and now Oracle were laying a trap, a patent trap for uh, Google for the last uh, several years as payback for Google essentially creating a, uh, a new runtime and a new uh, uh, around their operating system to uh, avoid uh, using Java and uh, Oracle now saying, well, you didn't, that didn't work and guess what, pay up. I, I think that the relationship between these two stories is, uh, is that because Google <coughs> is showing such weakness, much in my opinion the way that uh, Yahoo uh, showed weakness uh, around its earning call a couple of years ago, and then Microsoft came in and and put the hammer down on them. I think that what Oracle's doing is 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 they're taking advantage of a uh, of uh, Google uh, losing some of their open source credibility, if you will, uh, and uh, becoming vulnerable to uh, attack as though you know they're just like everybody else, uh, which I think is uh, Andrew's point. And certainly Danny's point. Uh, John, do you have any comments on that? You know, it's a, it's it's fascinating, and I think you're right. I, I think they're 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 showing. Um, uh, Oracle is, of course, a very um, you know aggressive company, and if a, if another company that's in its sights that does anything shows the signs of weakness, Oracle um, stands to gain by attacking it. Um, I tweeted that maybe Oracle bought Sun just to do patent litigation. Um, I, you know, I was I was being facetious, but it's uh, it's pretty interesting if you think about all the th all the assets that Sun has. Um, 
I don't know what I don't know exactly all all the patents that are in here. Um, yeah, I, I, I've read through a few of them. They seem so high level. It probably brings up a should bring up another discussion on what should be patented and not, um, and whether the patent office is valuable or providing just uh, you know room for litigation with these companies. But um, I think I think that this is going to be settled <laughs> out of out of court and it will just be like you know um, it will kind of die down um, just like almost other, every other lawsuit lawsuit is because it just doesn't seem like they've made a really strong connection between uh, from what I read in the in the uh, um, the filing uh, between what they have and what Google used with Android well I think it certainly puts Android in doubt uh, in terms of uh, this whole you know wireless situation where uh, Google is, you know, essentially giving this away for free, and they're not doing what Sun did, and they're, they're not indemnifying any of this code. So, uh, you know, it 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 makes the whole rationale of uh, Android is free; the carriers should adopt it. Uh, we're we're going to move to, uh, you know, essentially replace Java and Sun as the uh, common lingua franca in the mobile space all of a sudden it's you know they they seem to be successful and at the very moment that they're successful oracle brings down the hammer i i i don't think that this is a trivial lawsuit and i don't think that this is about settling i think it's about uh uh you know establishing uh java's footprint back in in play yeah. and uh, and you know keep in mind uh, as andrew said sometimes this is just about people uh, you know, Larry uh, Ellison is one of Steve Jobs' best friends. So I, I don't think this is just accidental that uh, these major companies are lining up on various sides of this mobile uh, takedown. I agree. I, I mean, as far as in indemnification goes, I mean, there's almost no indemnification in almost all the open source things that are out there. I mean, there's always modules that are that are put out there. And part of being open was uh, the feeling that you'd never be sued because you're using kind of a module that somebody you know had had developed on using an open source using GPL or something like like that. Um, so it's it's got to be very specific that that Google had used a uh, or broke a license agreement within in in these uh, you know seven different patents here that it was not under GPL because. It's really kind of confusing what is GPL and what is not with with Java in the first place, um, and that that's why I think it will be long and drawn out and probably will settle. But you, it's a good point you bring about uh, about Larry and Steve though. Uh, maybe it is personal. Anybody? No, it's interesting that my uh, tweet about uh, jQuery mobile coming out is getting a lot more retweets than all this stuff. I think there's some sort of saturation that we're hitting with both of these issues that they've been discussed pretty pretty thoroughly in the tw Twitter sphere. All right, well, what are you talking about? jQuery what? Uh, J jQuery is a mobile framework for building um, touch-optimized uh, UIs, and it's they just announced a <laughs> new mobile uh, mobile framework. So... Lots of people retweeting it, saying it's huge and stuff like that. I assume that's based on Java, and uh, no, I I don't know enough about jQuery. I have to go and interview those guys. Well, I think that the you know there are many reasons why uh, this Oracle deal is not necessarily uh, the darling of the uh, tweetosphere. Uh, most people don't really care about the enterprise space in the in the in the you know, in the normal social media circles, but uh, I think that they will care if their uh, if their Droid Two suddenly go dead because uh, <laughs> I better I, check. <laughs> I, I doubt that would happen. I I think you know Google will pay out a few billion dollars if the if it came to that, or maybe even more than a few billion. Making their Android uh, investment really pay off, right? Yeah. <laughs> Since they're not making any money on it now. Yeah, well, they would say that you know what's good for the internet's good for them. So evidently, that that would be good if they were to pay out uh, billions of dollars to the internet. Maybe we should just uh, they should go direct to us and give everybody a bonus. 
But are most of you uh, still pretty bullish on the Android in general terms? As yeah, they, they just platform? passed Apple in terms of market share, according to some reports. And RIM also. Sure. I think, well, we're right? not counting the OS, you know, the iPhone 4 sales yet, but, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I, uh, Audible, while we've been talking, just announced their mobile version on uh, Android, so developers are continuing to jump on board, and that makes it an interesting uh, right. platform. There are 20,000 uh, iPad apps right now. That's yep. Let's see, how many uh, are, are the, of the uh, Android uh, pads are there? Zero. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they got the Dell, uh, the Deve Dell devices out now. It's kind of a maxi phone or mini pad. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't think they're going to use that second one. <laughs> but it, it would be fair to say that um, that if you were to look at Google overall, that obviously search is their key business. But if they do have a second business now, it's Android, and that it, it is a real business. Yeah, what? well, but I mean, Android's not going to their bottom line, and that actually keeps hurting them because you have these financial analysts who keep saying, well, gosh, the iPhone is generating, what, 30% or more of Apple's profits, that, you know, because Apple's making money off every unit sold. And then they look at Google and they're like, how much money do you make off of each Android unit? And Google's like, well, we don't make any money off of each Android unit. And so they go, well, I guess it's not helping you. And they don't see the broader picture that it helps them in ways such as prevents Apple from just growing any further and possibly dropping Google as a search provider and hurting Google's bottom line that way, plus extending Google services to lots of Android users, and then they start making benefits intangibly off of that. But, but yeah, you know, as a, as a business itself, it's very difficult for them to express in cold hard cash what it's earning for them and I think that hurts them even though I, I agree I think they're having a, a huge success for it in other ways well I think that I think you're both right in the sense that uh, if uh, Google were were able to have a credible social media play uh, that they would be able to take advantage of of the Android breakout because all those objects are essentially identity uh, keys uh, for the people that are, that own them uh, and there are credit cards attached, and that's been the real strength of the App Store and, and what Apple's done. So there's definitely a lot of gold at the end of that rainbow. If that's true, then, you know, how easy is it going to be, or difficult is more to the case, for uh, uh, Google to be able to uh, re-engineer and recombine uh, all of their different uh, uh, social uh, tools into a credible offering. And, you know, if you see what happened to Wave and you see what happened to Buzz and you see what happened to Orkut and you see what, you know, et cetera, et cetera, it doesn't seem like they have uh, uh, figured out how to be able to do this. And I'm not, it's not clear to me whether, uh, you know, the, uh, the move toward Verizon is going to sit well with the very constituency where they need to try and, uh, and establish some credibility. Robert, what do you think about that? I, I, I'm not. <laughs> I don't have anything to say right now. Well, I mean, what do you think about uh, you? You've seen a lot of uh, uh, social products that have been emerging. There's a, a new track uh, capability that ah. uh, has come out. Yeah. Uh, do you see that as something that Google is going to uh, be interested in acquiring or have something to do with? Uh, it's not their network that that uh, is being tracked. It's Twitter's network. Yeah, they, they seem we're to be talking about data out. sift. Yeah, you're talking about data sift, and uh, mm -hmm. Nick is actually standing by in the chat room to talk about it if if we need him. Um, well, when he ships some code, maybe we'll have him on the show. Yeah, I, 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 he says he'll show me a demo in a in a week or two, so we should have him on the show right after Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, and what it. What he's promising that it will do is very, very interesting. I mean, you, you, in fact, we started out the chat room talking with him about, could you get rid of everybody who's talking about the Fast Company Influence Project? And he said, absolutely, yes. You're going to be able to sift the, the real-time stream uh, and, and get rid of things or include things into uh, a new a column, maybe on TweetDeck. I mean, I have TweetDeck running, real-time TweetDeck running on this screen over here. And it's pretty crazy how... It, it uh, now that the Twitter world is turning into this real time thing. Um, now I could see I need another column over here where I'm going to uh, 
use data sift to uh, shove stuff into a new column with stuff that I want out of you know hashtags out of location or uh, you know out of pe people you could say show me all the things with the word Obama in them that were written by people with more than 5,000 followers for instance or you could say show me all the items about Mexican restaurants but written in uh, Half Moon Bay and that that would be uh, that, that real-time filtering tracking mechanism is something you've asked for for a long time and that and uh, looks like we are g getting close to getting it back <laughs> Right, uh, but th you know the question then is, is uh, what I was trying to ask. Uh, yeah, maybe, Danny, maybe Danny, you can. Uh, is uh, Google going to want to do Google, that? Does Google have a, a social play that they can graft onto uh, uh, onto their search business? Um, I I don't see that you. I mean, I don't think search and social are the same. I don't think you graft it on, but I I think you mean can they succeed in social in the way that they succeeded in search and have a really strong product mm -hmm. um, maybe <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know that it's going to be that they're going to go through and somehow consolidate all these other things that they've done they may just continue to go and, and work from scratch um, I think you know their most successful thing would be if they could manage to buy a, a Twitter you know, they're, they're, I doubt they're ever going to get the opportunity to buy somebody like Facebook, but that would be much better if they can do it. Although, um, Danny, you it, know, it's it, one of the most interesting things Google's done is the Google profile, which is really ugly and, and not usable for much value, but they've, they, they've clearly been studying uh, the social world and how we all link to each other and what, we're, what kind of data we're putting into it. It's just they haven't gotten their with a system that lets us um, actually get some value out of this out of these feeds well I, I think that the challenge they face is why why do I need another you know what are they going to give me that I can't get elsewhere it's it's like well, Microsoft well, Twitter challenge. search only shows you four days of tweets yeah uh, Google, Google, provides, Google can show us a few more days <laughs> Google, but Google does do that Google has a huge archive and in fact that's what Google is going to continue to be doing because Twitter sees Google doing that, and okay, so Google is going to take care of that for us. We don't need to worry about on this aspect of it. But that's, you know, that's more of importance to people who are really hardcore trying to go back into the Twitter stream. That's not the social activity that Twitter really right. wants to tap into. And I think so. When you ask, well, what is Twitter going to do that makes me not want to use Facebook? Right? I don't know. Are they going to just build another Facebook that? I, I doesn't think that's have anybody line. in it and then try but to convince everybody. I, I think that Twitter you have to make a distinction between real-time and social. Well, and I, I think what Google's what opportunity might be to have a real-time search mechanism. But when it comes to social, it's so foreign to them, that, and everybody really says that, particularly insiders, that, that they don't really have a chance of keeping up with Facebook. Yeah, but even, even yeah. if it... Let's say it wasn't foreign to them, right? And I agree with that, by the way. They, they don't really seem to have social in their DNA, right? But let's say it wasn't, you know, foreign to them, and they really got the social religion, and they hired all the right people. Well, what are they going to make that's making me quit Facebook? It's like saying, what is Microsoft going to build that right. makes me not want to search on Google? Well, yeah. Google's doing a great job for me, so there's no particular reason for me to go over and start using Bing if I'm happy with with Google. If you've got 500 million people who seem to be happy using Facebook, by and large, what am I getting from Google that I can't get from Facebook, right? And so, and 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 Twitter is actually giving me something different than Facebook in that it's in many ways a Facebook light. I may just want to micro blog, and I don't want to have all the other junk that I have to take with Facebook. So it's very simple, it's very easy for me to use. So I think if well, Google's going to have a success, I, I think if Google's going to have a success in the social space, yeah. they really need to do what they always say they do, and not provide the same old, same old. Yeah. And I I, I agree with that, Danny. What do you think about Google's moves into uh, gaming? Because that seems to be associated with this. You know, it, somebody said there was an interesting um, cultural difference between Google workers and Facebook workers. Facebook workers understand that you're going to waste time on their website. That's, that's their goal in life. 
Google's uh, workers, their goal in life is to have you go off of their website as fast as possible because that's how they provide value on Google, right? If they provide the right link right at the top of the, of the Google page and you click it and you leave Google and go to where you wanted to go, that's the value Google gives to all of us. Where on Facebook, it's things like, uh, you know, Farmville, which we're going to sit there all night long and play Farmville with each other. Or we're going to, you know, check out who's, who's uh, in a relationship with who tonight, you know. And, and those kinds of behaviors are time-wasting behaviors that Google just culturally doesn't understand. But now they're going into the video game space, which is a time-wasting behavior. And so it'll be really interesting to see if they can get a clue about that. I, I don't know. Google's a big place with thousands of people. So on the one hand, you can say they don't have social in their DNA or they don't have time-wasting in their DNA. And then on the other hand, sometimes you're talking about very small units that are in control of, say, search or something like that. So I, I think it's certainly fair to say that Google doesn't have a lot of time-wasting properties. YouTube yeah. is probably the primary time-wasting property that they have. And I would, I'd probably argue that the people at YouTube have a pretty good idea on how people will be happy to waste all the time they want in the world over there. But I, I think the reason the games are appealing to them is simply the money to be made there, especially off the ads. And I think it's also um, a potential Trojan horse for them, right? If you can't build another Facebook and you can't win on Facebook, then you win by making money off of Facebook and you get your stuff in there. And that, you know, potentially gives you two successes. You're, you're making money off of something that's rising great and getting some of the data of what's happening there. And you're also then causing Facebook to have to decide, oh, do we need to build our own games? Do we need to build our own game companies? And then do we need to be fighting against the developers that supposedly are our partners? Because if they start singling out Google and Google Games on Facebook, then other people who start to get successful have to wonder whether or not they'll be next and whether Facebook really is supposed to be a platform for anybody to use, which I think is kind of the argument that they like to put out there. Or if it's really just, you know, you can do stuff on Facebook until you're too big on the radar screen and they're going to hit you over the head. Yeah. But what about real-time search? Why is, Robert, why is it so difficult still to make to, to, to search why, why isn't that the obvious because there's not group? there's not enough meta first of all I mean if you look at Twitter search they can't keep enough tweets in their database to search to let let you search for historical purposes but I thought they uh, opened the fire hose isn't that the whole point? the fire hose is different than the search search means you have to have tons of servers well, that are collecting the fire hose and so you can go through it with a search engine but doesn't so Google right have now, that? you can only search yeah, back mean, four days on Twitter search they so, do have that so if they you want to search for entire let me talk let me talk about it because you asked a very specific question if you want to go back to the Chinese earthquake and get some data out of, out of the tweets that were discussed around the Chinese earthquake it's impossible and so so Google has an opportunity here to jump in. I mean, I, that's why I was excited about FriendFeed because FriendFeed was, and still is, gathering all of my tweets forever. I can go back on FriendFeed to tweets that were written a year and a half ago and, and search on them. I can't do that on Twitter search. So Google can play a point in here. But it, you asked a more specific question about why isn't real-time search taken off? I mean, uh, one riot is pivoting. Pivoting is the word that startups use for, you know, <laughs> for, no, for realizing they failed on one business model, and now we have to pull another business model out of our behind and uh, put it on the table. Right, not dying, uh, just dying. <laughs> dying. <laughs> dying and trying to you know, get something going. Um, it's hard to do real-time search and pull value out of these tweets. There's not enough, or out of Facebook, or there's not enough metadata for you to search on and sift things, you know, out. Um, oh. And we're starting well, to get. Wait, I don't. I don't understand why you say. I mean, Google has a real-time search engine, Andrew. What, have you not used it, or do you not? Is it not doing what you want from it? Well, I mean, it's not. Where track. is it? What, track what is the, it's, track is, is, is real time alerts of no, it, no, it's not real time alerts. Real -time. They have an entire real time search engine. I can tell you right now. Oh, I know they do, but they have it at the top. Of, if you want to sit on Google's page, you can watch the yeah. the uh, uh, real time uh, information come in as it uh, you know maybe with a two or three second uh, delay. So it's definitely real time. But is that a is that an interface? Is that a dashboard, a console that people want to use? 
I mean, clearly they don't. They'd rather use TweetDeck. I mean, that's not my favorite interface, all these columns. I mean, it's just what what is needed and what I've been wanting for a long time is an integrated, uh, what I call, I forget what I call it, cross, uh, um, what, you know, mixing these signals together into a filtered stream that is based on the social graph in terms of the importance to me of what it is that I'm looking for yeah. uh, and and interstitial uh, displays of tracked items as they occur. Not, yeah, you know what? Other not a, not that, going back into the guide. past. Sorry? Other people call that a guide. No, yeah, no, I, no. I'm talking about an alerting yeah. mechanism that's on the cusp between uh, catching up and uh, being alerted in real time to somebody uh, or, or some entity that I was not anticipating trying to communicate with me and people who are interested in the same things that I'm interested in or vice versa. That's a real-time communications network that's based on the filtering and the harvesting of a worldwide, uh, you know, information bus, and you know maybe data sift will be there. Uh, I, I question whether or not Twitter is going to let that uh, uh, really build itself out before they try and lock it down, because the vulnerability that uh, Twitter has to such a track mechanism is that uh, it makes uh, you know staying on Twitter alone sort of uh, irrelevant you know if you can basically harvest what you're interested in uh, you know with a good sampling of discovery uh, then you might want to take that and package it up in a different network like uh, Facebook uh, is probably going to do so you know the rights uh, implications of a track environment uh, I mean that's why Twitter shut it down in the first place it wasn't because they couldn't sustain it they couldn't sustain anything they, yeah. they shut it down because it violates uh, their notion, however uh, ill thought out, that they can somehow control all the information on their network. I think you're right. And I think that this is where, this is the space between all these big companies we've been talking about. And no one can quite figure it out, right? Well, I think there are some companies that can figure it out. Who? Yeah. Well, so Nick has been skyping me and saying that he's going to that uh, data sift is going to do exactly what what uh, Steve wants it to do. So data sift. Uh, yeah, that's the new thing that that Nick Halstead, the founder of uh, TweetMeme, okay. announced yesterday. Oh, yeah. um, I think data the problem sift. is we we're talking about two separate concepts. One is real-time data sifting or tracking, what Steve calls it, and one is searching. Uh, I just went to Google and did a search for find me the tw you know tweet uh, plane that fell into the Hudson. I know that there was a tweet that somebody took and put a tweet pickup and and we saw it right. You can't find that tweet. You can find all the articles that were listed linked off of the tweet and linked to it, but you can't find that original tweet. So we do not have real searching of tweets and of Facebook items and of Google Buzz items and, 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 other, and LinkedIn items. And Google has a big part to play here. If Google can make that, make it so that we can search the real-time web the, or the social web or whatever you want to call it, um, I, I think that will be a huge deal. And we're well, I just, but I just put into Google, tweet Hudson River Aeroplane, and the first thing that came up is a tweet saying there's a plane in the Hudson, I'm on the ferry going to pick up the people, crazy. Tweet, uh, I'm on Google right now, what did you search on? I put tweet Hudson yep. River Aeroplane, and I got Janice Crum saying there's a plane in the Hudson, I'm on the ferry going to pick up the people, crazy. And that's that's interesting because the search I did didn't show that. So that's that's but they're good. against you because Robert, they're in bed with me because we're all in bed together because we're big companies. They're probably right. discriminating. Robert, but I want to only not, see tweets. Not, I, now Robert. the third item is from the Telegraph, Robert. and there's a Business Insider. I only want to see tweets. I want to have a search engine that lets me go through all the tweets and find value out of that. And I can't do that go right ahead, now. Go ahead, Danny. Uh, Robert, you're not getting that because Google's archive doesn't go back that far yet. They're still importing in and they're still pulling in the older stuff from Twitter. Now, down the line, maybe you could get it. That The challenge that you're really talking about is the fact that the relevancy of their real-time search results tends to be on the freshness. 
you know, they do have top tweets, they do have other things, but, yeah. you know, that sort of thing's coming. But then what Andrew's demonstrating is some of the important stuff, the old-fashioned, we look at what everybody's linking to, things still works. It's interesting because that, not only do you get the actual tweet for Tweet Hudson River Airplane, but the third listing that I get is the actual twit pick. Yeah, I get that too. I get the same thing. John, what do you think about uh, the enterprise uh, value of these two different uh, technologies? If, if Robert's right and one is track is real time alerts and uh, uh, and the other is a sort of a historical search, uh, how is this going to be uh, uh, fed to the uh, business community? Well, I think uh, if you look at enterprise applications, the the top used feature in most of them is search, and uh, it's shown to be a poor metaphor for how people want to to use their and look up their data. Um, I think that a search that could build a list or could build a, an automatic filter that would uh, pop up the alerts that you're talking about, you know, per track would be kind of the ideal solution for me and I think other people will just want the alerts they'll follow things that they like in the data model uh, for example in this SFA an opportunity or if it's a, in a financial application a, um, a contract um, or a bill uh, or order an invoice whatever they're doing and they'll find that and those alerts will be pushed to them um, I think that search is going to kind of go away because after a while so many people have searched that automatically the filters that people want will will exist and they'll just be part of that part of that enterprise but I so think that'd be Danny uh, you're gonna have to change the name of your blog search is in way. okay so explain the two of you please uh, work this out right now well search, search is gonna go away because What's being described is, if you went back into 1997, it was called agents, and agents will figure out everything you want. People always have things that they didn't know they wanted until they wanted, and then that to get the answers, they have to do a search. So, agreed, if you're constantly searching for some stuff, you can have systems that will then come through and suggest, hey, here's some other things that I found, should I set up a standing alert, which in itself really is just a search, but you're not overtly doing it. But there's still something that happens that you didn't know that you needed, and now you need. I get a new phone. I need a new case for that phone. I never had the phone before. It, nothing knows to just tell me about that case. So that's that's why I say search isn't going to go away. You always have. You I don't know, think search is going to go away on the, especially on the consumer side. But on the enterprise side, there's very specific things that people are looking for and want, and um, and they'll those things will be constructed and they'll be monitored and there'll be analytics around them. Um, I don't think search is going to go completely away. I think it just becomes uh, the secondary mechanism after the push uh, from the system itself to you. And it's not agents. Agents um, agents were constructed by a separate division, usually in IT, that tried to alleviate IT workload. And so they set up agents in order to you know push things into the... Um, you know, that people could add them into components and build applications based on agents. This is very different if it's already part of the system. Um, then it's uh, then it come then it will come to you as a push. Just uh, really like Facebook pushes data to you. Uh, I don't do a lot of Facebook searches. I, sometimes I search on a group or something like that. But for the most part, the data that's pushed to me is data I'm, I'm interested in by following things. And I think that kind of metaphor will trans translate right into the enterprise world very quickly. What does that mean, the enterprise world? I don't understand. Uh, do you buy stuff? What's the difference between the enterprise world and the real world? Uh, well, they're, well, they're merging. Um, but what is the enterprise world? Do you buy stuff? What do you mean, like food? Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, how do you think those companies uh, uh, run themselves in order to get the food uh, to you? They use Google, right? Uh, no, they use uh, various kinds of uh, information systems uh, that are, you know, rapidly changing from uh, on-premise solutions to uh, cl cloud computing-based solutions. But what, I still don't understand this idea that somehow 
people in the enterprise won't use search. Right? It's not clear what that actually. I don't think that's no, what but said. they're searching for different things. When you're when you're working in a big company, you're wor you're looking for value inside the firewall that's not on the public internet. Oh, I see. Uh, so you're just searching within your own corporate knowledge area. Right, and and that's why uh, chatter is so interesting, and why the the search searching will be matter real time search will matter in the enterprise just as it will matter on the outside right while we're f fighting about finding a, a tweet about a plane crash in the hudson uh inside a company you're going to be you know looking for who visited uh you know procter and gamble last week or a month ago mm, and absolutely. who is working together on a project or where who has a powerpoint deck that uh can, that I, I can take to Procter & Gamble next week, or who has the data that can back up a decision that we're about to make. Yeah, and, know, uh, uh, and where are they, at what location via uh, you know, GPS, et cetera, et cetera. So location services becomes the bridge to uh, local uh, where all the money is. But search has become so in central certainly to my life it's unimaginable that it would go away i mean that's why google is such a profound company it may fail in lots of other areas and may people may not like it well i think this is why i was uh, saying you know graft uh, to danny earlier uh, and i think he called me out correctly on saying that it wasn't really that but uh, there is some sort of metamorphosis that uh, John is suggesting it's going to go on in terms of search, that it's going to become part of a suite of services that, uh, uh, you know, that may tip the where the revenue flows out of, out of what today is flowing uh, in large part to search. Would you agree yeah, with that? As I, as I said before, search is the number one feature in a, in a front office enterprise application. It's not going to go away anytime soon. But the more that the data, relevant data, is pushed to people, the less people will have to search on the, for what they were trying to find. Because right. it'll be, because it'll be it, the early bird gets the worm. I mean, that's the whole gesture, uh, you know, concept is that uh, if if you are reacting to what people are telling you they're interested in finding out about, uh, that that's a lot more efficient than searching for a needle in a haystack. Now, uh, Danny, uh, do you? Do you think that Google search is a needle in a haystack approach, or is it uh, sort of a, a hybrid which involves uh, you know page rank dynamics, etc.? No, I don't think it's needle in a haystack at all. I mean, you you do searches and you find things you want on Google all the time. That's that's finding what you want without a lot of hay in the place. So how do you how does Google deliver uh, you know search in real time? Since uh, we already discussed this, I mean, they're delivering it as a f uh, as a fact, but not as a f so. Product. We I don't think we know how they deliver search in real time because I don't think we know how a bulk of consumers actually want it right now, or that they necessarily want it. Right? I mean, if Andrew wanted to find that important tweet, he found it pretty easily, and he didn't have to go to a special real time search to do it. Which, by the way, is what Google ought to do. Right? You shouldn't have to try to figure out. <laughs> which of their services will do the thing you want. They should just do the right thing when you search, ideally. Um, you know, Robert may have some very specific things that he wants, and their service may not be up to snap, and maybe they need to build that out, or maybe it's just not a big enough market for them to bother with, and then you've got smaller players like Autopsy that will do that sort of thing. Um, I think that certainly they've been going along... One of the biggest challenges that they've faced, I think, in terms of real-time search is that a lot more news has been breaking on real-time search and that things like Google News would typically be 20 minutes behind. Not because the, the news was 20 minutes late, it's just that it was based on news organizations writing articles and putting it up. So what real-time search has certainly done for them is the ability that if you have done a search and something has literally just broken, now in their top search results, you can see that. You can see the links. You can see people talking about it. That that was probably one to me one of the biggest things that they really needed to do in terms of real time search, and they've done it. Where we go with it from there, I, I'm really not certain. You know, there's certainly a lot of discovery aspect where people are interested in the trends and what people are chattering about and stuff like that. Um, some of what happens with real time search is just picking up the signals to make regular search better. 
Um, and certainly there's going to be a lot of enterprise kinds of applications and there's companies that are already doing that sort of stuff. I don't know that Google will necessarily go into that space. They typically haven't done a lot of enterprise stuff. I mean, Google Docs and things like that, but they've typically not done a lot of enterprise monitoring types of things that they could do with their search data. Um, and why, I don't know. I, I suspect they just figure it's not worth the time compared to the money they make off of consumer-oriented products. Well, they're going to have to come up with a few billion dollars extra, so maybe they'll uh, they'll start doing what we've been talking about. Uh, sure. Let's uh, wrap this one up because uh, this has been going what? on quite a while. Well, Go one, ahead, one last thing: uh, uh, Twitter just turned on a new feature with T lists, which is a guide for lists. And on the right side of my uh, Twitter uh, account now, it says what what things I'm included in, like uh, what lists. What groups of lists I'm included in, and that's a pretty interesting new feature that I'm just playing with right now. Well, I'm glad since you're the only one who actually uses lists. <laughs> just kidding. But I'm not, and uh, <laughs> if you look at your account, I'm sure that's your account. I, you'll notice I, there are no lists on my account because I've never done one. No, it, it, it shows you which lists other people have put you on. Yeah. So you're on the technology list. I get list, it. I get it. I web get it. development list and tech and science list. I get so. it. Well, I didn't use Twitter for a year after I uh, signed on either. Um, <laughs> so maybe you're right, but I doubt you're on, it. You're on I mean, 730 lists, by the way. So somebody's using them. Well, uh, that's great. I, I'm totally in favor of it. I think it's the most important thing that's been done since... Uh, what was that uh, new scam? Uh, page scam? What is that called? Fresh board. Oh, you talking about Flipboard? Flip, flip, flip scam. scam. Right. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, Robert, have you dyed your hair? <laughs> no. You look very blonde to me. Okay. I, I usually am blonde. <laughs> Andrew, is this your final contribution? <laughs> Let me search on that. <laughs> Andrew, There's a great uh, blonde joke, by the way, for you, uh, Andrew. You'll find it on Google. <laughs> Andrew, last thoughts. My last thought is I think. Um, Google, Google will ultimately they they'll be challenged when the machine knows what we want before we know it. But yeah. until then, they are for all our for all the irritations we have with them, they are the heart of search, and they're never going to be dislodged. Just as I think Facebook's the heart probably of social, and that no company can ever do more than one thing. That's the nature of life. Okay. Uh John, uh, I think uh, I think Google has a multi multi front war that they're facing um, with Apple, with Oracle, with um, uh, you know the the FCC apparently, um, and uh, they will uh, um, have to come up with a, a more cohesive strategy or. And, or I should say, and a better way of marketing what they're doing and, and being more transparent and to regain the trust of of the uh, of the people who use the services. Uh, Danny, in terms of where Google's going, just last thoughts. I'm just wrapping it up. Oh, last thought. Um. Oh, series awesome. Robert was right. <laughs> we didn't even talk about that. Um, what was that? I, you know, Google had their. I was saying that Siri is awesome and that Robert was right. Um, Google had their press conference yesterday where they announced these voice to action features that we didn't talk about, but this is where you could tell your phone you wanted to do certain things in the way that Siri is allowed. And it was interesting to see it come out, and I've actually played with it a lot more. So, you know, I have which, to make which, whole Which do you Robert. think was implemented better? Uh, Google. I, and I'm going to do a long comparison with it, but it's incredibly fast. You. You speak into your phone and you say, text Robert, I'm going to be there in five minutes. And like that, it's gone. You know, and Siri, it's like, when I've been doing that and some things with Siri, it's like, okay, I'm thinking about it. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to do this? Okay. So, um, but in the things that we've been talking about, um, you know, last thoughts, um, you know, I, I don't know. Google's becoming a big grown-up company. And uh, I think we can expect to see it's going to do more things that a lot more people will disagree with, um, you know, because it's going to have to continue to make compromises as it's been doing for, for some time. I don't know that that means that it's evil. I just think it's probably more that it's practical. 
Okay, Robert, last one. Um, Google's evil, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I don't know about Siri, but uh, I can't wait for the little sign to come up and say that I'm sorry. Uh, that uh, voice search is in violation of uh, Sun's patents. Please call again next time. This is uh, Steve Gilmore. This has been the Gilmore Gang. I want to thank uh, uh, everybody who showed up, and especially those who didn't, and particularly these four gentlemen, Danny Sullivan, John Toshek. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Scoble. Thanks for having me. And uh, Andrew Keene. I want to thank, uh, thank you. Rackspace, and particularly Rob Jess, without whom this uh, uh, show would not be back on the air. And uh, at least as long as... Uh, Verizon allows us to be on the air. And uh, I want to thank uh, New Tech and their fabulous TriCaster for uh, making this into a video show. And I want to thank our producer and director, Tina Chase, and uh, all the puppies for being relatively quiet this, this show. <laughs> we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.